If you're somebody who has experienced childhood trauma or highly sensitive or really even just empathetic, there's a good chance that you are feeling a lot of energy and maybe you're aware of it and maybe you're not. And if you're not, it's likely having even more of an impact. And today I want to talk a little bit about what some of that might be to really just kind of bring it out into the open because the more aware we are, the better off we become. Welcome. I'm Peggy Oliveira. Thanks so much for joining me. <laughs> so full disclosure here, um, this is not an easy conversation to have. Um, possibly not an easy conversation for you to be a part of. Um, and I have started and stopped recording this video already a handful of times. Um, and I even did a video kind of about this before I took my time off, um, but have decided to redo it. Because this is in so many ways a very complex issue and very multi-layered and I know that I am not going to be able to cover everything that I really want to be able to cover in what I'm going to try to make a relatively short video, kind of my normal time frames. So please bear with me. For those of you that are new to me, um, Part of what I'm going to be talking about may seem odd for me to be talking about as somebody who talks about healing from childhood trauma, but in reality, what I'm talking about is very direct, directly related to various aspects of healing from childhood trauma. For those of you that have followed me for a while, you are already going to be aware of some of what I share. Um, but I still think that it might be an important conversation for us to have together. So if you are not aware yet of what I'm speaking to, I am talking about what is happening at this particular time in the U.S. around this election cycle. So I want to be clear that I am talking about what's happening in the U.S., However, what happens in the U.S. often is impacting what's happening in other countries as well, from individual conversations that people are having, different feelings that people are having, to their own governments. So I am very aware that this goes far beyond what's happening in the U.S., and I know that I have a lot of people who watch my videos who are not in the U.S., and even in your own countries, you experience some of this um, in your own systems and stuff as well. So it really does, I think, apply across the board for people. So you might be thinking, well, what is this really about? This is not a political page and you shouldn't be talking about politics. And the reality is I'm not going to be talking about politics. And there was certainly a time that I would have said, I am not political, that I'm not a political person. And in all reality, that is still true. I don't like politics. I don't really have an interest in politics. But even for people who don't do politics, politics is doing you. And what I mean by that is that we don't have to know anything about it. We don't have to care. We can be completely disengaged from everything that's happening. But that doesn't mean that you are not still greatly affected by what is happening within our government, which is politics. So I want to, I'm going to try to stay on track here because again, this is a very multi-layered conversation. So there are two things that I really want to be able to share with you. And that is being able to understand how you might be impacted right now and possibly even some things that you might be able to do to help with that. And particularly for those that might be a little bit newer to me, I want to share a little bit with you about 
my process and my thinking. So really presencing the reality of what is happening. So no matter where you fall on the spectrum, whether you're very engaged or you just wish you could jump ahead to next February, <laughs> um, which wouldn't that be nice? Um, you are likely hearing things. You're likely seeing things. Maybe you're even participating in things that are affecting you. One of the things that has happened for a lot of people is that, and this started about nine years ago, um, or yeah, um, that our kind of political election cycles have created some challenges within relationships. It has caused people to even question things about themselves and people that they know and all kinds of things. So being able to recognize that I think is really important. And because this has been going on to this degree for the time that it has, it's kind of easy to experience it as in a sense, a new normal. And with that sort of acceptance that this is our new normal, part of how we cope with it being our new normal is avoidance and denial. And as you've heard me say many times, when we avoid or deny, we are still being impacted by things. We're just not aware and therefore not able to do things to help us. So um, first of all, if you are feeling, whether it's an, an aspect of feeling somewhat depressed, feeling anxious, feeling fearful, feeling irritable, um, particularly if you've just maybe watched something on the news or seen some sort of social media post or heard a conversation, saw a bumper sticker, whatever it might be, um, know that you're not alone and recognize that if that is happening for you, then there is a lot happening internally that you're feeling about what is happening around you. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to go out and do something about it, but being able to recognize that it is there, that you're being impacted by it is important. And for a lot of people, again, there are differing opinions, different values within families and, and even friendships, friend groups and that sort of thing. And that can feel really challenging. So allow yourself to recognize that. Doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do anything with it. That's another conversation. But just being able to recognize how you're feeling about the situation, about the circumstance is important, no matter where you fall. And I, this might be important for me to say, for you to hear, actually. It's not important for me to say. It may be important for you to hear. I am not politically, I am not affiliated with either political party. I am an independent. I always have been. And there's a very specific reason that I am an independent. I do not believe in a two party system. Um, and the reason for that isn't just about politics. The reason for that has to do with how government is ran, which affects policy, which affects systems. So, in case you're wondering about that, I just want to be clear about who I am in that regard. So again, no matter where you fall in regards to what you think or who you like or don't like or anything else, there's likely a lot happening around you that is affecting you. And if you are involved, it's not necessarily that it's going to affect you more, because you'll actually probably have a lot of support around you, um, but you're going to be exposed to it likely more. So um, you might be feeling more energy even around it more consistently than other people might. So 
I would encourage you first right now to just take a moment and check in with yourself and just notice what feels present for you. Are you able to relate to anything that I'm sharing? Again, no, no party affiliation or anything like that, but are you able to recognize that maybe you felt some of that? Um, going into different places and even like seeing like different restaurants or even like a doctor's office might have a news station on and the news that they are broadcasting, right? That can have an effect. And in a lot of ways, and I'm not going to get into all of those details right now. If you want me to let me know and, and I can go into that more. But um, the reality is that particularly in the US, you really cannot avoid it. And if you're not in the US, I imagine it's pretty frustrating to <laughs> be dealing with things that you have absolutely no control over. Not that we have a lot of control, but we can vote. Um, but the uncertainty, the various things that people think in other countries. And part of my time away, I was in Europe. And even in Europe, it was, there were a lot of conversations about what is happening here in the US. So even away on a holiday, I couldn't escape it. Um, and certainly they were involved in what was going on. So again, just really presencing that to recognize that there's a good chance it's likely having an impact on you, whether you're in the US or not, um, particularly as a survivor. Um, particularly as a survivor, whether you're consciously aware or not. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about letting you know kind of where I fall in this not in terms of who I'm voting for or anything else, though that might become pretty clear. Um, again, my upbringing, um, my family was not political. They did, they were affiliated with a party. Well, technically, I don't know if they were registered in that party or not, um, but I know that they voted in a particular way. And, but we never, had a conversation about politics or anything like that. So I did not become aware of politics until much later in life. Um, when I decided to become a social worker, part of the reason that I was really drawn to social work is because of what social work is, what social work stands for, kind of the purpose of what being a social worker means. Now, a lot of people think of social workers as people that work like in child protective services. Sometimes people think of social workers as being clinical social workers. And in the in reality, the majority of people that provide psychotherapy in the US are licensed clinical social workers, which I think a lot of times people are surprised by. I actually was <laughs> surprised to know that. Um, but social work encompasses a lot of various roles, including being involved in public policy. Um, so there are a lot of things that you can do with a social work degree. But part of what I really loved about the idea of social work is that it incorporates both kind of the psychological and the sociological. Um, and also that it views a person. So whether you're whether you're working with somebody one on one within their community or on a much bigger um, kind of way in a macro sort of way, you think about people as an individual who lives and experiences their life within a system, and that system is part of their local community, their larger community, and the largest part of the community. So the US, if you're in, uh, if you're in the America, or even the planet. So you're looking at the individual within each of those aspects. 
And when I said, even if you don't do politics, politics is doing you, what I mean by that is that you are an individual and each of those communities, so to speak, are heavily, heavily influenced, if not actually dictated by the systems within those other aspects. So in social work, or it's not just in social work, but micro, macro, and meso, or micro, meso, and macro. Um, and so it's the various levels of, of that, of the systems that we are engaged in. And so those systems that we are a part of that are impacting pretty much everything in our lives, those come about in large part from the policies that are created within our government. Now, I am not an expert on any of that. I was not interested in government when I was in school. Um, I'm not involved in that kind of thing at this particular time. So I am not going to suggest nor pretend or even speak about it as though I have a good understanding of all of those aspects. Now, as a social worker, I understand the systemic aspect of it. I understand the influence of those things. And as a social worker, a huge tenet of that is that Within each of those, social justice is a significant aspect, is paramount in all of it. And social justice is, it incorporates several things. Much of it is about equality. It's about access to resources. It is about people having equal rights. It's about people having equal access to information. Um, certainly about equality in the justice system. It, it really encompasses really pretty much all aspects of life to some degree or another. Now, if you have followed me for a while, you know that I talk about how when we are healing, or even with the impact of our trauma, that it's not just about the trauma, right? That it's about all the other things that you experienced in your life, the things that you continue to experience, the level of support that you have currently. And some of those things, I would say probably a lot of those things actually, are influenced and or dictated by some of those systems. So um, one example, and this is personal for me as both a survivor and then as a therapist, and I've shared a little bit of this, but not in this context necessarily. So I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of it here, but as a survivor, when I first started my healing journey, I went to my local rape crisis center and they provided all of their services for free. So it didn't matter if you had money or not, if you could afford to pay for services, all of their services were free. They accepted donations. Um, they went out into the community. They did, you know, they did fundraising sorts of things, um, but their services were free for everybody. And one of the reasons that they were able to do that, as is the case with organizations across the country, um, one of the reasons that they were able to do that is because of a bill that was passed many years ago called the Violence Against Women Act. And um, I, I can't actually remember when this was passed, but I started my healing in the like mid 90s. And at that time, it existed. I'm almost 100% positive. I might be wrong about that. Um, but I know when I started working there in 2001, it was definitely um, present. But when I went there as a client, I got to receive services. I got individual services and I received group counseling services for free. And then several years later, when I started working there, part of my salary was funded by the Violence Against Women Act. So not only our salaries 
provided by the Violence Against Women Act, but the other services, the advocacy, the hospital advocacy, the medical advocacy, the um, legal advocacy, the therapy, the group counseling, the resources, the financial resources that we were able to give people if they needed a safe place to stay, the ability to go out and do trainings for judges and police and medical professionals and in the community. All of that was possible in part, in, in fairly large part, from the Violence Against Women Act. And that happened at the national level. And every so many years, I don't remember now what that is, that is up again for renewal. I don't think that's the technical term. Like I said, I'm not a political person. But every so often that has to be basically um, approved again. And if it is not approved, a lot of nonprofit organizations that provide invaluable services to their community, whether they're free or maybe even paid on a sliding scale or something, will lose a significant portion of their funding. And so thinking about that, like even thinking about our center was funded in part by the Violence Against Women Act. We were a domestic violence, sexual assault, and elder abuse center. And part of what we did was medical advocacy. And that was predominantly if somebody was assaulted, including a child, if they went into an advocacy center or the hospital, children would sometimes go into the advocacy center or to the hospital, uh, we were called, as hospital advocates, we were called to come and support the person through the process and through the medical exam and all of that, which is pretty horrendous. Um, so we supported them and we also shared with them what their rights as a victim of sexual assault, what their rights were. And if that funding goes away, those services are at risk. And those services are invaluable for so many reasons. Even the clothing that somebody gets, if they have to go through a rape kit to collect evidence, their clothing is often bagged and sent in for evidence and they have no clothing. They've experienced probably the worst thing in their life, not just with the assault itself, but then the exam and the questioning and all of that and then they have nothing to wear. And again, part of the funding, and it wasn't just the Violence Against Women Act, they, we also received funding from United Way and like I said, private donations. So the fund, there was a lot of funding there, but um, part of what we did was provide clothing for people to wear when they left the hospital. And I share this with you because again, even if you are not involved in politics, politics is involved with you. And like I said, that's a very, very personal example for me because I was able to receive services because of it and I was able to provide services because of it. And still to this day, I don't know what the numbers are, but when we think about how many people are affected and, and seek resources and show up at the hospital, there are unfortunately far too many people who need access to those resources. So something as kind of small in terms of niched, I guess I could say, um, you know, just that one thing as an example that most people have no idea how that happens or where it comes from and, and nor should you have to. That is a direct result of policy. And policy, again, comes from our government officials. So from having adequate health care, mental health care, access to medications, um, feeling safe, in our homes, in our environments, in our communities, being knowing that no matter who you are or 
how you look, whether you are able to do things other people can do, whether you, and I'm talking about able-bodied versus, versus being disabled, whether you, you know, no matter what your skin color is, no matter what religion you practice or don't, uh, no matter who you might love or not, whether you have children or don't, all of that. There are policies in place that affect your ability to feel secure, accepted, happy, that allow for the opportunity for you to feel a sense of security and groundedness to be able to heal. One of the things that was, I think, very significant, and I do have some personal, a personal connection to this as well, is access to medical resources. And I have been very fortunate in my kind of mid-adult life, not very early in my adult life, although my husband was in the military, so we did have medical um, insurance. But I have had medical insurance for a long time, and for the most part, it's been pretty good. And so that has not been an issue for me. Um, my son has a um, ongoing medical condition, and there was a time not very long ago at all that he could be de denied medical insurance purely because he had a pre-existing condition. And I also now have some pre-existing conditions, um, but he would be denied medical insurance. He literally would not be able to get medical insurance. And for anybody who's ever had not had medical insurance, not having medical insurance in the U.S. can be extremely detrimental to our emotional well-being as well as devastating financially. So with our healthcare system it is certainly policy that created a circumstance in which people have better access to medical care and very significantly nobody can be denied insurance because of a pre-existing condition additionally and this probably affects a lot of you watching who are in the u.s Additionally, and very significantly, mental health has to be covered. It is by law required that mental health services and access has to be covered at the same, to the same degree to which medical services are covered. Because before that, there was, in a lot of insurance, mental health care sometimes wasn't covered at all or would be very limited in its coverage. And going back to the pre-existing condition, a lot of times if you had a diagnosis of a mental health condition, so anything, even um, like adjustment disorder, that could be used against you in getting additional health insurance and potentially even life insurance as well. So another example of how far reaching our policy is and the impact that it has on people, even when you're not aware that it is. So the other reason that I wanted to share a little bit about that is because I, not so much on YouTube, but I, um, on my social media, I do sometimes share things about human rights and social justice and equal rights. And like I, in my Etsy shop, I did a lot of things for Pride Month. And um, if you were to go and view my Etsy shop, um, you will see some things related to equal rights and human rights and freedom and um, 
some things that are very related to our emotional well-being related and and within our emotional well-being things that directly affect that like equality and having our rights and being safe um, and maintaining a sense of freedom no matter who you are and I believe those things because I believe that we all deserve to feel safe to feel grounded in that sense of safety to be accepted to be empathetic to not only be kind but to for all of us to be able to experience kindness and trust that we're not alone in the fight that we're in and i believe that for everybody no matter who you are no matter what you look like no matter who you might vote for i believe that for everybody so um and it's okay if you disagree with me i know that in sharing this that there may be some of you who are going to be upset that i've shared this that you may stop following me and that is absolutely your prerogative and you get to choose that but know that what you're disagreeing with me about is something that I feel strongly about for your protection and your well-being as well. So I would love to hear from you. If you disagree with me, I would still love to hear from you. You, I, I do ask and kind of require that you disagree in a respectful way. Um, but you are absolutely welcome to disagree about whatever it is that you might disagree about. And if you agree, you're certainly welcome to share that as well. But you don't have to agree or disagree with me to recognize that what is happening around us, this time that we are in, is impacting us, every single one of us, whether we are consciously aware of it or not. And we all deserve to feel secure and free. Thanks so much for watching. I'll look forward to seeing you next time.